So I just had a really cracking weekend of Betfair trading. And typically what I do is I'll sort of say to people, I really like today, I don't like the look of today, and I'll highlight where opportunities are in the card. And every now and again, I'll give you heads up on something that's interesting, or I will post a chart and sort of comment on a particular trade. So this weekend, I put up this particular chart and said, what an absolutely cracking trade that it was. And inevitably, people started asking questions about it. And as I was about to type some replies to these questions, I thought, well, you know what, why don't I just produce a video on what was so special about this trade? If you're interested in learning to use BetAngel, head on over to our website where you can download a free trial. If you're interested in learning how to use it, then head over to the BetAngel Academy where you can do exactly that. And if you want to talk to like-minded people, then head on over to our forum. So when I'm actively trading on horse racing on Betfair, what I'm doing is I have in my head a whole range of potential scenarios that I've seen before, things that are well practiced. And I spend all of my time looking for those opportunities within the markets. And there could be a range of different types of opportunities. It could be particular setups, particular races. But typically I'll start the day by going across the entire card and just having a look at what is out there. I will scroll down on Guardian see what types of races are in front of me, but I will also go to racing websites to see where the feature races are and things like that. So that's the preliminary thing that I do at the beginning of the day is I focus in on all of that sort of stuff. Now, when we look at individual races, um, certain characteristics will come out of those particular races. So I know that races that have a shorter priced favorite uh, within the market uh, tend to exhibit the most amount of movement. So those are the markets that you tend to look for sort of nice big moves on. And when you get to the very competitive handicaps, those tend to have the narrowest trading ranges. They tend to be the ones uh, that don't exhibit a lot of movement. It doesn't mean that they, they can't. It just means that they're much less likely. So I'm beginning to look at those sort of characteristics. And then, as you've seen um, in another video that I produced, I then start looking at the timing of when I'm going to get involved in the market, how long I have to be active on the market and so on. But that's the sort of preliminary stuff that I do at the beginning of the day. Um, and then as we begin to get towards the start of the race, that's some of the sort of stuff that I tend to focus on. So as I approach a market, I'm assessing it from a number of perspectives, but I'm making some basic fundamental decisions on what I expect to see. If I see a competitive handicap with loads of prize money and very high quality horses, I know that what's going to happen is the traded range is going to get crushed effectively because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the market. And while that sounds weird, basically nobody knows who's going to win. So the money flows in equally on all horses within that particular race. However, if you get a short priced favorite, uh, then the money will be focused on that favorite. It will trade the majority of money within the market. And that tends to make the market swing around a little bit but also different race types as well. So a handicap is geared to be um, uncertain and all horses are supposed to have an equal chance of winning. But when we get a maiden or a similar race, um, then there's no constraint within the market in terms of how that's expected to unfold. So on this particular race, it was a novice race and a novice race is basically for inexperienced horses. And while it's not quite the same as a maiden, it exhibits sort of similar characteristics in terms of how uh, the market will trade, especially if you've got a clear favourite. So as we approach this market on the card, uh, there are a number of key characteristics that you could see. You could see basically that it was at a shorter price, it was a clear favourite, all of the money would be focused on it, and therefore the price is likely to move around a bit as people adjust their opinions on this particular runner. But also we could see from the name of the race that it was a novice race, so this was generally for inexperienced horses. And this is, you know, a key facet of this particular trade. But in your head, you'll have a score card of things that you can see. And you can basically say, well, you know, it's a, a novice or a maiden. It's at a shorter price. The money's going to be focused on it. There isn't much prize money. It's, you know, it's not a feature race as such. So you would go through and you'd tick off these lists. And basically, as you go down that particular list, that would give you an idea of whether you should get involved in the trade or not. Now, from your individual trading perspective from whatever your trading plan is and so on, you would add other elements into there as well. So you'd sort of say, well, it's come from a high price to a lower price or it's uh, consistently drifting the price and something else is getting pulled in. We can see backing activity further down the book. 
Um, the chart looks the following way. It seems to have hit a point of resistance or support or something like that. And you create this list in your head of the ideal scenario, things that you would like to see in the market. And then you would grade that particular opportunity, that particular trade, according to that list that you have created. So when you go down that particular list, if it scores like a one out of 10, you just go, I'm not going to trade that. So I can give you an example of a one out of 10, and that would be a low quality small field um, uh, at Foslas um, or perhaps Banga for me, uh, because those markets are, are very difficult to trade accurately. And that is that I find them difficult to predict exactly what the behavior of those markets is. So do you know what my response is to a very low scoring race? That is to not trade it. It's a great way of avoiding losses or you'd significantly reduce your stakes on that where you may use a 500 or a thousand pound uh, stake on a race that you're familiar with, that you, you sort of know what is likely to happen. You dramatically reduce your stakes where you don't know what's going to happen. So yeah, grade every race according to certain opportunities. Can you see something that looks interesting? Has it bottomed? Is there loads of money at this price? Um, what is the chart telling you? What type of race is it? Um, is the timing right? Is it not clashing? Blah, blah, blah. You add up that entire list to create the opportunity for you. And if you get a 10 out of 10, then you can absolutely smash the race to smithereens. And the race that we had uh, this weekend that I put the chart up on was almost the perfect trade. Not quite, but almost the perfect trade for the following reasons. So 10 out of 10 trades or near perfect trades as this one was uh, are pretty rare. They don't occur on a regular basis. You have to be really switched on and alert to catch these opportunities. But as you're scanning through the card, you'll see potential candidates for good trades or races that may do something interesting. And as a consequence, you keep your eye on those particular races. Now, when I'm actively trading, I'm switching from one race to the next, looking for any key opportunities. And that's exactly what happened in this particular race, because I was keeping an eye on what the favorite was doing. And then something really interesting began to happen. So as you can see here, the horse um, was being a bit recalcitrant, as they would say. It didn't really want to go to post. They were having trouble getting it to settle and to go to post. And this is one of those markers that you would put on that you know, perfect trade checklist. You'd have maybe 10, 15 items. It's up to you how many you want to have. As you get more involved and more experienced, you tend to add more items to it. But this is one of those items that I actually put on the list. And this is why when I finish trading on one race, I tend to go straight to the next so I can just see what's going on on course. Because if the horse is playing up and it's at a short price, what do you think is going to happen to the price? It's going to go out. People will stop backing it or they will start actively laying it and sending the price out. So the key to this particular trade was a number of different facets. Uh, but fundamentally speaking, this was, you know, the key trigger for this spectacular drift that we saw. It was very easy to spot if you're keeping your eyes on the course. And the interesting thing about Chepstow is this is a course that is covered by total performance data. So when you were looking at these pictures live, I was already active and in the market. I knew what was likely to happen because I could actually see the horses walking around the parade ring. I could see that the favorite was the last out of the parade ring. And I could see that, you know, while there potentially was a problem, I didn't know for sure until I saw the live pictures, but I could see that this wasn't particularly normal behavior. So I could start drip feeding those trades into the market. And then of course, as soon as the horse appeared on all the TV pictures, and then the price really started to drift significantly. And the more it played up, the more that it would drift. Now, if we actually look at the chart, you'll see that it drifted to a certain point and then turned around and came back in. So what do you think happened there? Well, it was quite simple, really. The horse got to the post, it settled and then was ready to race. It looked a lot more settled at that particular point, uh, significantly better behaved. And therefore, of course, that was your natural exit point on this particular trade. So, yeah, you know, there are many facets that build up to that particular point uh, that allow you to take advantage of these sort of opportunities and the better technology and the better software that you have and the easier it is for you to pick up on these opportunities. So when you turn up to a race, you should have a list of things that you're looking for. Some of those will be done before the race. You know, what's the weather like? Uh, what sort of race type is it? What do we expect to happen? And then as we approach the race, you'll be looking at more important information such as where is it within the market? How much money's been matched? Are we seeing support for other runners? Those sort of things. You can create that checklist. When you first start trading, it's very difficult to go through that checklist quickly. 
Now you're going to have to go through it slowly, look at each of those items, and then by then the market has moved already. But having that list will allow you to speed up and have a structure to the way that you trade. And you'll get faster and faster at doing it. Initially, you'll be behind the market, but eventually you'll be in front of the market. And sometimes the market just presents opportunities for you because things uh, like we saw at Chepstow happen and that tells you immediately what to do within the market or certainly where your bias should be in the market with whatever strategy that you're pursuing. Because sometimes, you know, despite looking at form and all of these other things, it really just boils down uh, to just being uh, alert to what's actually going on within the course itself. All pricing on horse racing is slightly subjective and people are looking very closely at the behaviour of the horse. So if that horse isn't behaving itself, then there's only one way that that price is going to go.